than this life. In the year 2000, the hit movie, that Remember the Titans, came out. And if you recall there, Coach Herman Boone was trying to instill in his players the importance of working together. The life that they had come from up to this particular time when they went to this football camp was going to be much different. And thus, he instilled in them some great principles about life. Life is precious. So much that the Bible gives us so many great confirmations and so many warnings about how life really is limited for us. In James chapter 4, verse 13 and following there, James says, Whereas you know not what is on tomorrow, for what is your life? It is then even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. In Psalm chapter 90 and verse number 12, there Moses records that our days are limited. And ultimately, he says that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. In Psalm 34 and verse number 35, there the psalmist says that our life is as a hand breath. That is not a, a saying that we use today, but if you would take your thumb and measure your thumb to the rest of your hand, the psalmist says that is equivalent to what your life is. In Job chapter 14 and verse 1, Job says, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. In the very same chapter, Job says, Yea, man dieth and wasted away, he giveth up the ghost, and where is he? The Bible teaches us so plainly and so clearly that life is short. And because life is short, because we don't have as much time as we think we have, we should get our hearts and minds ready for eternity. If you remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and following there, of course, the saints, Paul there lets us know how they were worried about the death of their loved one. And Paul, again, goes into that account there. And then in verse number 18 of that chapter, Paul would say, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. There's something special about the idea of heaven. There's something special about what's beyond the grave for those of us who have already obeyed the gospel and those of us who have been living the life God will have us to live. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 18, Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Paul was saying Philippians chapter 1 verse 21, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul goes on ultimately to say, showing us how there is something far better than what this life has to offer. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse number 3, Peter there records, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He says in verse 4, To an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, notice this, reserved in heaven for you. As John records the words of our Lord in John 14, 1 and following, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. There I am, there ye may be also. Our culture and our world would tell us today, you only live once. In fact, you should live your best life because we really don't know what's beyond the grave. We really don't know if God has something set aside special for his people. And thus, the phrase YOLO is ringing throughout high school halls all throughout the country. You only live once. In fact, this life is all that we have. Is there truly something beyond the grave for us believers? Is there truly something far better that we can put our hope and our expectation upon? You see, again, our culture has done a really good job at changing the word hope. When we talk about hope today, and often when we talk to people who are members of the body of Christ, we ask them the question, are you going to heaven? And what did they say? Man, I hope so. I hope I'm doing enough on this side of life where God is going to, gain, where God is going to allow me to have access into heaven. But the hope that the Bible talks about is not a wishful thinking, but it's an expectation. As Christians, we can have confidence in heaven. We can have confidence that there truly is something that is greater than this life. 
The Bible teaches us from Genesis all the way to Revelation about the importance on how God values life. If you remember in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible there says, God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and that individual, that clump of dirt more or less, it became a living soul, a moving and an actual human being. And then in that very same chapter in Genesis 2, God says, it's not good for man to be alone, so let me make someone suitable for him. God values life. Life is so precious. And yet we have people in our world today. They throw their lives away. They do everything they can to get all the pressures and all the pleasures this life has to offer. But those things are not the end. If you remember in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24 and following there, the Bible speaking of Moses. The Bible says, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter. Why is that? Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin that were only going to last for a season. Yes, God did create this earth for our good pleasure, but this was never going to be the end. This was never going to be our stopping place. But heaven was always in the mind of God. The church, as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 3, 8 to verse number 11, it was in the eternal mind of God before Genesis 1 verse 1 ever was written, before Moses ever penned that by inspiration. The church and heaven was always going to be the plan. Is there really something better than this life? Of all the things this life has to give us, our family members, our friends, our loved ones, our jobs, our homes, is there really something better than this life has to offer? I want to share with you this afternoon four points, and I hope, Justin, I pray that these four points will be beneficial for all of us in our walk with the Lord this afternoon. We invite you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. And as you're turning your Bible there, of course, the book of Hebrews, the Hebrews writer is encouraging many of these saints, if not all of these saints, to not go back to Judaism. There was so much pressure from without and from within to be like everyone else. And thus the Hebrews writer is writing them, encouraging them not to go back. Why is that? Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 1 and following, God who has sundry in times and in diverse manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, having these last days spoken unto us by his son. What is the Hebrews writer showing us in this first chapter? That Jesus is better. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than, every, than anything this world has ever seen. You're going to find that word better some 13 times throughout the book of Hebrews. And he's showing us that Jesus is just simply better. Jesus, there is no rival, there is no equal, he's better than anything we can come up with our own mind and by our own ingenuity. And so in Hebrews chapter 11, the Hebrews writer here gives us four things, hopefully, that can help us answer this question. Again, the question that has been presented to us is, you believe what? You believe that there is something better than this life. The unbeliever, the person who hasn't come to know the truth of the gospel, the person who is still living in the world, they don't know what we know. And thus they're asking the question, how can you say that there's something beyond the grave? How can you say that there is something greater than this life? Life must be treating you bad. No, my friends, life is treating me great. And I'm looking forward to the day that I can be with my Savior for all eternity. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1, let's notice our first first point this afternoon. Why do you believe that there is something better than this life? Number one this afternoon, it is simply because I have faith. In Hebrews 11 and verse 1, the Bible there says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. For by it, verse 2, the elders attained a good report. The Hebrews writer says in verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So those things which are seen were not made of those things which do appear. Verse 4 he says, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by the which he obtained witness that he was righteous God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Verse 5 he says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not seek death. For before his translation, he had this testimony that pleased God. In verse number six, he says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe 
that he is and that he's a and that he is a reward of those that diligently seek him. And then in verse number seven, he says, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, he moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by the which he became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. The Hebrews writer is showing us the reason we can know that there is something far greater than this life is because of the faith we have. You see, friends, faith is the key that unlocks the door, spiritually speaking, to the kingdom of God. Faith is the fuel that we put in our cars that will allow us to drive, spiritually speaking, into eternity. Again, the Hebrew writer says in verse 1, faith is the substance. It is the foundation of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians 3 rather, verse 10 and following, there Paul says to the brethren at Corinth, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as the great builder. He says, I have laid the foundation in another builder thereon. He says in verse number 11, but let every man take heed how he builds thereon. Why? For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, that being Jesus Christ. The reason why many in the world are not convinced that there is something greater than this life is because their foundation is broken. Their foundation is solid. And thus, they don't have the answer to the question. Why is there something better than this life? Why is there something better than what our natural eyes can see? You see, our world has done a really good job again at convincing us how faith is something we need to be able to see so much that if I can physically put my hands on it, if it's something that's not tangible, I can't have any faith into it. Friends, brethren, hear me well. I've never been to heaven, but I know it's real because I have faith. I've never seen the face of my Lord, but I know he's real. Why? Because I have faith. I've never seen John 2, Jesus turned the water into wine. I've never seen Jesus actually heal the nobleman's son. I've never seen Jesus feed multitudes with only a limited amount of resources. I've never seen him do any of those things. But how can I have faith? How can I trust that? I'm not trusting. Not just the event that happened, but I'm trusting the one who made the event happen. I'm putting my trust and my confidence and my faith in the one who framed the worlds by just speaking things into existence. I'm being asked to trust he who is all knowing, he who is all powerful. I'm being asked to put my faith in someone's foundation who is not solid or who is not broken. If you remember this morning, Brother Grider used a verse there, Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 24 and following there. Of course, there Jesus gives us the great sermon on the mount. But in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24 and following, Jesus there is now going to talk about these two great foundations. Jesus says in Matthew 7 and verse number 24, Therefore, whosoever hear these sayings of mine and do with them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not. Why? Because it was founded upon a rock. And then he says, there's another man, therefore whosoever hear these sayings in mind and do with them not, I will liken him unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The Bible there says that they were astonished at his teachings. They were astonished at the things he said. You see, the things Jesus said over 2,000 years ago, friends, is still applicable today. If our foundation is not built on Jesus, if our foundation is not built on the truth of the gospel, then our foundation is broken. And thus, when people ask us the question, how are you convinced, how do you know that there is something greater than this life? I have faith. I believe. I trust the one who knows everything. The Bible there says again in verse number 6, Hebrews 11 and verse number 6, it does say a lot about us, but it also says a lot about God as well. The Bible there says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God or to be pleasing to God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, notice this, he must believe that he is, And must believe that he is a rewarder of those that diligently or that obediently seek him. 
And then he goes and gives us another illustration in verse number 7. The Bible there says, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, he moved with fear, he moved with reverence, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, and thus became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Even though Noah had never seen rain come out of the sky, Noah just kept building, Noah just kept getting everyone ready, so much that in Genesis 6 and verse number 3, the Bible there says Noah, at least over or up to that particular point, was preaching some 120 years. Imagine all the pleading he did with those people to get it right on this side. Why is that? Because there's something coming. Not only is judgment coming in this world, but it's coming in the world to come. And so what Jesus does in Matthew 24 when his disciples are asking him about the end of time, that discourse there. In the first 34 chapters of Matthew 24, Jesus is going to answer them in regards to the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus says there's going to be signs. You're going to know the destruction of Jerusalem is intimate. Is intimate. But he says in Matthew 24 verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour know if no man know, not the angels in heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were given into marriage until that day Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He says, there's not going to be signs when the second coming is coming. But it's not so much when he's coming. <laughs> it's are we ready when he comes? Is our foundation solid this afternoon? Is our foundation going to hold us up to the pressures and the temptations that this life has to offer? You see, again, the question is not so much, do you believe there is something better than this life? But why do we believe that? Why are we here on a Sunday afternoon when we can be at home watching the game, doing all the other things? Because we believe that there is something so much greater than this life has to offer. I love sports. I love watching sports. I love hanging out with family members and friends. But my favorite thing to do is being around those of like precious faith. Being able to offer songs up to God. Being able to take a part of the communion every first day of the week. Being able to give of our means. Being able to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ preached so we can invigor and ignite my soul so I can go out and help others and try to convince them. Man, judgment is coming. This world is not everything that it has. There's something greater uh, than this world. If you remember in Luke chapter 16, verse 19 and following, the Bible there gives us the account of the rich man and Lazarus. And in Luke chapter 16 and verse number 19, the Bible there says, There was a certain rich man that was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. And there was a beggar named Lazarus, which laid at the rich man gate full of sores. The Bible there says, and desiring, that's the Greek word he was longing for, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Here it is, and it came to pass that when the beggar died, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Luke 16, verse 19 the Bible there says, in hell he lifted up his eyes. Hades, better translate there. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And he see Lazarus afar off and Abraham in his bosom. And he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. Here it is, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. The Bible ultimately says that there is a great goat fix. And then he says, send him back. Send me back. I have five brothers that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And the Bible there says, replying to him says, if they hear not Moses nor the prophets, they won't be persuaded if one rose from the dead. He said, no, they have to see that. They have to see a man actually rise from the dead. But what's so interesting is, as you read the gospel accounts, Jesus literally raised a man from the dead, and people still didn't believe. Their foundation was broken. Why do you believe this afternoon that there is something so much greater than this life? I tell you why, friends. It's because we have faith. 
But number two, notice Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 through 16. Not only do we have faith in the fact that there is something greater than this life, but in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 13 to verse number 16 there, we not only have faith, but we also have focus. You know, in this world, there are so many things that distract us. I have a little saying I like to say, distractions don't look like distractions until they finish distracting us. We think we have the mindset and the power in ourselves. You know what? This is not a distraction. I have focus until the very thing we thought was not going to distract us. It distracted us. In Hebrews 11 and verse 13, the Bible there says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And they were persuaded of them and embraced them, that they were strangers and pilgrims upon the earth. For they that say these things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from which they came out, they might have had an opportunity to return. But notice verse 16. The Bible says, but now they desire, here it is, a better country. That is, in heavenly country, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. In Hebrews 11 and verse 10, the Bible, they're speaking of Abraham, how Abraham looked for a city which have no foundations, whose builder and whose maker is God. Friends, our Lord, our God, according to John 14 and verse number one, is preparing us something far greater than we could ever think of. In the Bible here in this context, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13 through 16, again, taking us all the way back to the characters he's talked about before. In verse number four, he talks about Abel. In verse number five, he talks about Enoch. In verse number seven, he talks about Noah. In verse number eight to verse number 12, he talks about Abraham and his wife Sarah as well. The Bible there says that these individuals, they look for a country. They look for a city. The Bible lets us know that Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 to verse 3, God more or less called Abraham. And we see that Abraham was going to spend the rest of his life in Hebrews chapter 11, 17 and following there, living the rest of his life in tents and tabernacles, being a soldier in a more or less. Are we willing to give up the comforts of this life to prepare ourselves for the next life? You see, there may come a time in your life, friends and, and neighbors, where we have to uh, separate ourselves from certain things because we want to make sure we're getting our lives ready for the next life. I'm not in any way saying this afternoon that this life is not beautiful. If you remember in Philippians chapter 1, Paul's statement there as he was talking to those brethren there, Paul says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you, verse 22. And then he says, and having this confidence... But before that, Paul says, man, if I go and be with my Lord, that is far better than anything this world has to offer. But Paul says, while I'm here, I want to preach and teach and continue to tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brethren, that's focus. I'm not a good test taker. I think I'm not the only one that can make that claim this afternoon. When you take tests, you have to be focused. It's not enough just to study. It's not enough just to have the material in your mind. But when the test is actually in front of you, you have to have some focus. How often in life are we so distracted by our family members, by our friends, that we no longer have the focus we need for heaven? Let me ask you a question. When was the last time a person came to us about this short life? They came to us telling us all the bad things this life has to offer. And sometimes, instead of reminding people about heaven, Instead of reminding them this world is not their home, instead of reminding them heaven will surely be worth it all, we often tell them all the ways this world is going to get better. I hope, trust, and I pray this world will get better. I hope more people will come to know Jesus and thus allow the gospel to change them from the inside out. I really hope that happens, friends and brethren. But what if the world continues to reject the gospel? What of the world hears the truth of what they have to do to be saved? They look at that and they say, no, sir, no, ma'am, I'm good. That should in any way change us in our view of God, in our view of the gospel. It takes faith to go to heaven, but it also takes focus. How focused are you this afternoon 
to keep your eyes fixated upon heaven, that you're not going to allow anything to distract you or get in your way of completing that mission. Number three this afternoon, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 17 to verse number 40, the Hebrews writer here again, he shows us that, again, the question is, why do you believe that there is something greater than this life? I have faith. Hebrews chapter 11, 1 to verse number 7. No, verse number 12, rather. Number 2, I have focus. Hebrews chapter 11, 13 to verse number 16. And now number 3, from verse number 17 all the way to verse number 40, I have fight. The great heroes of the Bible that we read about in this particular chapter, they did struggle. You just read from verse number 17, the Bible there speaking about Abraham and how he had to offer his son. That takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 22, 1 to verse number 12. You read about in Genesis chapter 11, verse number 24 and following there, verse number 21 and following there, speaking of Moses. And all the things Moses had to endure, all the things he had to go through. Here you have Moses in Genesis chapter, in Exodus chapter 3 rather, God is speaking to him in the midst of the burning bush. Moses is telling God why he can't go back to Egypt. In Exodus 5, 1 and 2, the Bible there says, and after what Moses and Aaron went in, and they told Pharaoh, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Exodus 5, verse 2, the Bible there says, Pharaoh says, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I know not the Lord, and neither will I let Israel go. The Bible there says Moses was choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin that was simply going to last for a season. What about Hebrews 11 and verse 30, where the Bible there says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down, taking us all the way back to Joshua chapter 6. God's people have always done the hard things. God's people have always done the necessary things because we want to be right with God. The Bible there in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 and following there, the Hebrews writer says, And what more shall I say? For time will fail me to tell thee of Gideon, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, who through faith did what? They subdued kingdoms, they wrought righteousness. And then the Bible there is going to get into one of my favorite characters, that being David. Friends, you don't think in 1 Samuel chapter 17, when Saul and the, all the brothers of David, here they are fearful and afraid, because the big bad giant Goliath has come knocking on their door. David said, I fought lions, I fought targets, and I fought bears. David said, more or less, Goliath is just the next man on the list. David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And too often in life, instead of telling, instead of telling our problems, how great God is, we tell God how great our problems are. You know, friends, all trials come in one size, smaller than God. Life is hard. It's tough. But do you really want to go to heaven? The songwriter asked the question, don't you want to go to that land? This world is not my home. We're marching to Zion. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. But it takes some fight to get there. It takes some focus. It also takes some faith. Number four this afternoon, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to verse number 3, before we make some application, in Hebrews 12 and verse number 1, the Bible there says, Seeing we are compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that has been set before us, looking unto Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and right now he is sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I have faith. I have focus. I have fight. But I also have to finish. Growing up, I really appreciated runners and how long, not sprinters, but runners, and the dedication and the commitment they had to run for as long as they did. 
You, re- you read and you watch people do marathons. And you see the commitment and the dedication they have for finishing. If you recall the uh, great marathon that takes place in Boston every year, I was reading an interview, an article rather, of a person that was doing an interview of a particular runner at that time. And the person simply said, my goal was to never run the race. My goal was to simply finish. How many Christians are so concerned about finishing first that they forget in this race you don't have to come in first? You just have to finish, friends. The Hebrews writer shows us these four important lessons for us this afternoon. Why do you believe that there is something better than this life? Why do you believe that God has something prepared for us on the other side? Because I have faith, I have focus, I have fight and also have some finish. The Bible shows us from cover to cover what individuals look like in terms of them finishing the race. Let's notice a couple of passages of Scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse number 1. Of course, in 2 Timothy 3 verse 15, Paul says, And from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures, which is able to make, which is able to make thee wise unto salvation. He talks about how all scripture is breathed out by God. But in 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, Paul there says, I charge thee that before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. He says in verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, shall they hate to themselves teachers having itch and ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But he says, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the working of evangelists, make full proof of thy ministry. Paul says, for I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. Paul says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, Paul says, but not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. In Revelation chapter 2, when John is writing to these saints in verse number 8 to verse number 10, John says, I know you've been tied, tried rather 10 days. But in verse number 10, if you recall in the context there, John is writing to these individuals and the text shows us here in verse number 10, John says, you have to be faithful until death and you'll have a crown of life. Imagine the pressures they were under to announce Caesar as king, to fold and break into being under that Roman government. Paul says, I know you all have been tried, but Paul says, be faithful until death. And you'll have a crown of life. Today I'm thinking about all the great soldiers, not just men, but women of the cross who've gone on before us. I'm thinking about all the influences that they had, not just on me, but of all of us this afternoon. But what's more important, and what really stands out, is that they finished the race that we're in. Friends, I would encourage all of us this afternoon as we ask ourselves this question, you believe what? You believe that there is something better than this life. You believe that there is a God in heaven who loves you and who cares for you so much that he's willing to do anything and everything to save you from your sins. I'm telling you that's exactly what I believe this afternoon. In Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5 and following, Paul there says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, verse 8, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross, verse 9, wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess those things that are in heaven and those things that are on the earth. Ask yourself the question this afternoon, why do I really believe that there is something better than what the Lord has in store for me on this side of life. 
I want to end our sermon this afternoon where we began. If you turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8 there, Paul leaves us some encouraging words that I think are really, really fitting for us in our lesson this afternoon. Of course, in Romans chapter 7 and verse 21 and following there, Paul says, I find then a law. Another sermon for another day. Paul says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me every day. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity. Verse number 24, he says, O wretched man that I am, rather. Chapter 8, verse number 1. There is therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. But in verse number 18, Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present world or time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Do you have faith this afternoon? Do you have focus? Do you have fight? I know it's tough. I know it's hard. I know you're tired. But are you willing to finish? Paul says, our last verse this afternoon, For the which cause we faint not. Though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, Paul says it worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Paul says, for the things which are seen temporal and the things which are not seen eternal. Chapter 5, verse 1 of 2 Corinthians, he says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, Listen to what he says. Highlight this in your Bible and also in your hearts. We have a building with God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Do you believe, truly believe, really believe that there is something better than this life? I assure you this afternoon it is. But in order for you to be a beneficiary or to benefit from the reservation that you have in heaven is you must become a member of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the greatest family on this side of life. And the great thing about the kingdom of God is we will always be family. And the Bible teaches us and it shows us how to become a member of that kingdom. You have to hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You have to have faith, friends. Hebrews 11 and verse number 6. You have to be willing to repent. Change your life, change your mind, be a servant of Christ as opposed to a servant of sin. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and upon that confession, we'll have the privilege of immersing you in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You may say this afternoon, man, I'm already a member. What do I have to do to be right with God? I've been struggling. I've been allowing my foundation to be cracked and solid and broken. The Bible teaches us. That if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, and he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says in 1 John 2, verse 1 and 2, we have an advocate. We have a propitiation for our sins, Jesus Christ the righteous. This afternoon, we beg you. You don't have to leave out of here the way you walked in. You can make it right, and you can make it right right now as we stand and as we sing.